This evening we're continuing our overview of the Old Testament book titled Psalms. And so with this as the focus, if you would, let's open our Bibles to Psalm 18. And as we make our way to the 18th chapter of Psalms, I just want to take a moment to set the stage for this incredible song of praise. I should first point out that this is yet another psalm written by King David. And not only that, but it's a song that was given to the chief musician of Israel so that this psalm could then be sung by the congregation corporately as they gathered together there at the tabernacle. It's also interesting to note that this psalm is not only found here in the book of Psalms, but we also find the lyrics of this song in 2 Samuel chapter 22 with just a few minor variations. As we compare the two chapters together, and as we consider the minor variations, it seems to me that the original song is actually probably found in 2 Samuel 22. And now here in the 18th chapter of Psalms, we find yet another version which was probably created for corporate praise. Well, you might also like to know that it was back in 2013, I actually spent six weeks expounding upon these lyrics from 2 Samuel chapter 22. And so if you're interested in doing a deeper dive on the contents of this song, well, then you can find that six weeks series on our website by simply searching for the series title, Praiseology. Uh, so the, the six week series, Praiseology, it really does a deep dive into all these verses. But we have 50 verses uh, here in this chapter, and uh, so we'll be done by at least uh, 1030. So with that, (laughs) let's turn our attention now to the 50 verses that we find here in the 18th Psalm. If you would look with me there beginning at verse 1, here we read to the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Now here in the beginning of this psalm, we find David, he's proclaiming his love for the Lord. And as he contemplated all of the ways that the Lord had delivered him from all of his enemies, he's now taking this time, probably at the end of his life, to acknowledge the fact that the Lord was the one who had provided him with the strength that he needed to gain the victory over every enemy. And it's for this reason that, the, that David here refers to the Lord as his rock. Not, not Dwayne Johnson, but, but rather the, the real rock. You know? And, and he, he celebrates the, the Lord as his rock. And, and that word rock found there in verse 2. It comes from a Hebrew word which was used to describe a natural cliff or a cleft which would provide a secure foundation for any military stronghold. And so David here, he's praising the Lord for providing him with the safety and the security that he needed from all of his enemies by becoming his rock, by becoming his shelter and his stronghold. David also proclaimed the praiseworthiness of the Lord as he described the Lord as his fortress. That word fortress, well, it's translated from a Hebrew word which uh, refers to a defensive castle or maybe some sort of secure stronghold. And so David here, he's praising the Lord for the way that the Lord had provided him with supernatural protection against all of his enemies. And David also praised the Lord here for the way that he delivered him from all the attacks of the enemy. And it's for this reason that David describes the Lord as his shield as well as the horn of his salvation. And it's for this reason, again, that David assured his audience that the Lord is worthy to be praised. The Lord is worthy to be be praised. And I would even argue that the Lord alone is worthy to be praised. And the reason why is because he alone is able to save his people from the enemy who comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. I'm grateful and I praise the Lord because Jesus has already defeated the enemy for us. We're not looking for, you know, some sort of future victory. We're looking for a future fulfillment, of course, but the victory's already won. We don't have to wonder if the Lord's going to gain the victory. No, he's already gained the victory. He's already defeated the enemy. He did this when he died for our sins on the cross. And now those who trust in him, well, we can take refuge 
in the stronghold of our Savior. Therefore, those who trust in Jesus, we ought to be praising him because he is our rock and our fortress and he is our deliverer. With this in mind, I want to continue to consider the way that David here sings the praises of our Savior. Let's pick up our study of the 18th Psalm, beginning at verse 4. Here David declares, The pangs of death surrounded me, and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him, even to his ears. Now here in these verses we find David, he's describing the different types of distress that led him to this point where he cries out to the Lord. And it's in verse 4 where he mentions the pangs of death that were surrounding him. Not only that, but he also mentions the floods of ungodliness that were filling his heart with fear. And in order to understand the snares of death that were confronting him, we should take a moment to consider the ocean of enemies that surrounded him on every side. David was distressed by the Syrians who lived to the north of Israel. He was also dealing with the Amalekites who lived to the south. There were the Moabites and the Ammonites who lived to the east. And then there were the Philistines who lived to the west. Without debate, David was surrounded by enemies on every single side. And it's for this reason that David cried out to the Lord so that he might be delivered from the enemies of Israel. And as we consider the way that David's distress led him to look for help from on high, we would also do well to remember that the trials of our lives should also lead us to seek the Lord. And in the day of our distress, we can enter the throne room of grace knowing that Jesus is there to help us in our time of need. Don't let your distress lead you to depression. Don't let your distress lead you to to despair. But rather, let your distress lead you to the Lord. And when you find yourself overwhelmed with all kinds of distress, let that be the red flag that, that reminds you to go back to the throne room of grace where the Lord is ready to help in our time of need. With this as the focus, I want to consider how the Lord then helped David to gain the victory over his enemy. And so let's pick up our study of the 18th Psalm. Look with me there, beginning at verse 7. Here David describes the Lord's response by declaring, Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice hailstones, and coals of fire. Here in these verses, we find King David, he's continuing to describe the way that the Lord delivered him from all of the the attacks of the enemy. And as we consider the way that the Lord answered David's prayer of distress, we must not fail to remember that the Lord is the Almighty One. He is the Almighty God who has sovereign authority over his creation. I'll remind you that that the Lord spoke forth the creation. And it, and it wasn't like hard work for him. And, and knowing that the Lord spoke forth the entirety of the creation, well, you better believe that he has the power to uh, intercede and interject and, and you, know, uh, you know, deal with, with the enemy in this sort of way. He can shake the very foundations of the earth. And I'm not saying every earthquake is you know, caused by the hand of God, but most certainly uh, we've seen times... You know, in the Bible, where God brought earthquakes, you know, uh, against the enemies of Israel. He can send down fire and brimstone upon this planet according to his perfect will. We know that he flooded the entire planet during the days of Noah. The Lord is able to use natural disasters to deliver his people from the attacks of the enemy. And that's what David is saying here. He's, He's praising the Lord for the way that the Lord used natural disasters to deliver him from his enemies. Therefore, we can rejoice in knowing that the, lay, that the Lord is actually able to defend those who trust in him. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that, you know, we get on our hands and knees and say, Lord, my boss is really being a jerk. Can, can you, you know, bring a sinkhole that would swallow his home or something like that? No, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be praying for that sort of thing. But I think we should pray for help from on high, that we should ask the Lord to help in our time of distress and allow him to protect us from the attacks of the enemy in any way that he chooses. And to further consider how the Lord can intercede for us in these sorts of ways, let's continue to consider the way that the Lord delivered David. And if you would look with me here in the 18th Psalm, let's begin reading at verse 14. Here David declares, He sent out his arrows and scattered the foe, lightnings in abundance, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, the foundations of the world were uncovered. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils, he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, he delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support." Here in these verses, we find David, he's describing the way that the Lord delivered him from the attacks of the enemy with an abundance of lightning strikes that he compares to to his arrows being scattered against the foe. It was with a deluge of storm waters that were created by the mighty winds that came from the nostrils of the Lord that pushed his enemy back. And while it's true that the enemy was too strong for him and for his military men, It's also true that the Lord showed up and supported the armies of Israel as he delivered them from those who hate the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. The Lord showed up and was their support. And as we consider the way that the Lord delivered David in in this day of calamity, well, we can rejoice in knowing that the Lord also knows how to deliver those who trust in him. I, I like the way that Paul put it in Hebrews chapter 13. It's there where he declares, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? I love that. He's saying, hey, be content. Don't don't go out there and try to win your own victories. Don't go go out there and try to start your own wars in in the hopes that you might conquer more and more. No, be content with what you have, but at the same time, don't worry about the attacks of the enemy because the Lord will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And since he is our helper, well, what man can come against him? If the Lord is our helper, if the Lord is our supporter, then we don't have to worry about the attacks of the enemy because what can man do to those that the Lord has decided to protect? If you've placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you can rejoice tonight in knowing that he is able to deliver us from the evil schemes of the enemy. And even when we're surrounded on every side, Even if we find ourselves surrounded on every side and we're completely distressed by those who want to harm us, we can simply rest in the refuge of our Redeemer. Because if Jesus is your rock, well then, who can come against you? The answer is nobody. And so we don't have to worry about it. That being the case, it's crucial for those who trust in the Lord to walk by faith as we continue to follow him. And I want to consider how David puts it here in the 18th Psalm. If you would look with me there at Psalm 18, verse 19, David here declares, He also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God for all his judgments were before me and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also blameless before him. I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. Now here in these verses, we find David, he's continuing to describe the deliverance of the Lord. And according to, the, to, to King David here, the Lord delivered him because the Lord delighted in him. That word delighted found in verse 19. It's translated from a Hebrew word which refers to someone who takes pleasure in another. And so a little bit of a humble brag here. Yeah, the Lord really digs me. The Lord really delights in me. 
The Lord was pleased with David. Therefore, the Lord was happy to deliver David from his enemies. Now, with that, uh, you know, we should take a moment to consider how the Lord rewarded David for the way that he committed himself to keeping the commandments of the Lord. But does that mean that David always kept the commandments? Does that mean that he was righteous in, in, the, in the sense that he never sinned against the Lord? Well, as we consider the way that David here describes himself as a blameless man before the Lord, it's important to understand that, that David's hands were clean, yes, and, and he was a man who was living according to the statutes and the judgments of God, yes, but it's important to realize that this also encompasses the idea that with sin came sacrifice. And so, was David a sinless man? No. And we've addressed this a few times already in our study of Psalms. We'll continue to address this. But David was not a sinless man. He was a blameless man. And, and, and there's some difference here. We know that David was a blameless man. Why? Well, because when he sinned, he would go and offer the right sacrifices for those sins. And therefore, you know, those temporary placeholder sacrifices that pointed to Jesus would cleanse his hands of those sins. And so he was blameless in the fact that he was maintaining the sacrificial system that, that would temporarily cover his sins as he waited for the arrival of the Messiah. We know that David was a repentant man, meaning that he was a sinner who would repent as quick as, as he realized that he had sinned against the Lord. For example, it's in the 51st Psalm where King David cries out, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. David was confessing his transgressions here. And in verse 2, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Clearly, David didn't see himself as a sinless individual, but rather a blameless individual who was righteous in his desire to keep the commandments of the Lord and so uh, in this way, we see then that David was a humble man who was quick to repent of his transgressions once he was aware of his wickedness. With that being the case, David rejoiced in the way that the Lord was willing to save those who approach him with the same sort of humble faith. And I want to consider how he puts it here in the 18th Psalm. If you would look with me there, beginning at verse 25 here, David declares, with the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With a blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. And with the devious, you will show yourself shrewd. For you will save the humble people, but will bring down haughty looks. For you will light my lamp. The Lord, my God, will enlighten my darkness. For by you, I can run against a troop. By my God, I can leap over a wall. Here in these verses, we find King David, he's, he's describing the way in which the Lord responds to each person individually. And while those who seek the merciful grace of God will receive the merciful grace of God, the devious schemers will discover that the Lord is able to see through their evil deceptions. Those who approach the Lord with a humble faith are going to be saved accordingly, while those who exalt themselves with foolish pride will soon be brought down according to the righteous judgment of the Lord. If you want to approach the Lord in the, uh, in the sense that you're righteous and that he should accept you because of all the good things that you've done, well, then you're going to be judged according to all the unrighteous things that you've done. But if you humbly come to him and, and, and place your faith in him, then he saves those who trust in him. With that being the case, the Lord delivered David because the Lord delighted in his humble faith. The Lord delighted in the humble faith of David. At the same time, the Lord also destroyed the enemies that surrounded him. And the reason why? Well, it's because the enemies of Israel were too proud to repent of their wickedness. And it's for this reason that the Lord empowered the armies of Israel to go and defeat those who were trying to exterminate the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. As for those who would question the Lord's decision to deliver Israel from their enemies, well, David goes on to remind us about the righteousness of our rock. I want to consider how he puts it here in the 18th Psalm. Look with me there beginning at verse 30. 
Here David declares, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? When it comes to the Lord's decision to deliver one nation while choosing to destroy another, we must not forget that God is perfect, and therefore his decisions are perfect. His decisions and judgments are always correct. They're always right. The Lord alone is God, and therefore he, you know, when he chooses to raise up a ruler, his decision is righteous, whether we understand it or not. Why did God raise up Biden for three and a half years here in America? I have no idea. Was he right? I, I'm, you know, who am I to question God? I don't know. But yeah, his decision is right. And, and who is he going to place in the White House you know, next year? I don't know. Is it going to be right? You better believe it. It's going to be righteous. Because he's the one who raises up rulers. He's the one that brings them down. And when he raises up a ruler, he's right to do it. And when he brings them down, he's right to do that as well. What's even more is that his word has been proven true time and time again. And that's what he says in verse 30 here. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. His word is proven time and time again. If you've never before, I challenge you tonight, spend some time studying prophecies found in the Old Testament and their fulfillments found in the New Testament. It's an incredible study to see how often God has presented the future in advance through prophecy and then it came to pass exactly the way he, he presented it. God's word is proven to be true. It's for this reason that David here sings the praises of the one whose word has been proven to be true. Therefore, since it's been proven to be true, then we can rejoice in knowing that he is a shield to those who trust in him. Will that always be proven right? You better believe it. His word says that he is a shield to all who trust in him. And therefore, we can rest in that tonight. As people are talking about World War III and as people are talking about, you know, what's happening right now with decisions in the White House regarding World War III and these sorts of things. It's like we can find ourselves filled with fear and it's just kind of like, well, wait, hold on a second. If you've placed your faith in the Lord and he's your rock, then you can also believe that he is the shield of those who trust in him. So why worry? To further grasp the gravity of this reality, let's consider how David glorifies the Lord who gave him the victory over every enemy. Notice again here in the 18th Psalm, we'll pick up our study beginning at verse 32. Here David declares, it is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of deer and sets me on my high places. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. Here in these verses we find David, he's continuing to sing the praises of the one who's empowered him with the strength that he needed so that he could go and defeat the enemies of Israel. He also gave God the credit here for the way that the Lord provided him with the wisdom that he needed to engage in all of the campaigns that brought their enemies to their knees. The Lord gave him that, that wisdom. David grew up a shepherd, not a military man. And yet the Lord gave him all the wisdom that he needed and, and the ability to bend a, a, a bow made of bronze. At the same time here, David's heart was filled with great gratitude as he considered the way that the Lord was the Savior who was shielding him with salvation from all of the enemies. And as we consider the way that David praised the one who empowered the armies of Israel, we'd also do well to realize that this is the same God who's been empowering them to defeat their enemies since 1948. 1948 is when the War of Independence started as Israel uh, you know, declared themselves to be a state. And, and you know, since then, they've been attacked time and time again. 
whether we're talking about the Arab-Israeli wars or the intifadas or the Lebanon wars. And, and the Lord has provided the state of Israel with supernatural power to defeat these enemies who continue to attack them. Even looking back to the War of Independence back in 1948, their military was so small and, and, and not even ready for that kind of a battle. And yet the Lord gave them the victory. Now listen, my, my heart breaks for all the civilian casualties what, on both sides of, of this war. My heart breaks for all the children who are dying and, and all those you know, people who probably want nothing to do with this battle. And yet, I can assure you that the Lord is continuing to enlarge the borders of Israel as he prepares the world for the time of Jacob's trouble, better known as the time of tribulation. And I guarantee you that if the enemies of Israel would stop attacking Israel, then the war would be over. It would be done. But they continue thinking that they can come in, conquer the land, divide it up. And every time the Lord says, nope, not allowing it. With all this in mind, I want to continue to consider the way that the Lord enabled David to conquer the same land that we're talking about during the days of David's reign. Let's pick up our study of the 18th Psalm, beginning at verse 36. Here David praises the Lord by declaring, You enlarged my path under me, so my feet did not slip. I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed. I have wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet, for you have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemies so that I destroyed those who hated me. They cried out, but there was none to save, even to the Lord, but he did not answer them. Then I beat them as fine as the dust before the wind. I cast them out like dirt in the streets. You have delivered me from the strivings of the people. You have made me the head of the nations. A people I have not known shall serve me. As soon as they hear of me, they obey me. The foreigners submit to me. The foreigners fade away and come frightened from their hideouts. Here in these verses, we find David, he's continuing to give God all of the credit and all of the glory for the way that he had subdued the enemies that surrounded Israel on every side. And according to David, it was by the power of our almighty God that he was able to overtake and wound and beat and destroy those who refuse to humble themselves before the Lord. At the same time, the Lord enlarged the path under David's feet. The Lord continued to enlarge the territory that he was conquering. And he enabled David to move forward with the sure footing of a solid foundation. And in this way, the Lord provided King David with the military advantage that he needed to go and subdue the people of the pagan nations who were at that point in time dwelling in the land of promise. And I realize that there are many in the world today who want to accuse Israel of now occupying land that does not belong to them. And that was the case back in the days of David as well. The Lord brought Israel into the land to conquer the land and drive the inhabitants out because they would not repent of their wickedness. And you better believe that those people attempted to defend their land, but the Lord wasn't having it. It was the point in time for their punishment, and God brought Israel in to accomplish that. And now we see people in the world today saying that, well, Israel, you know, these people are taking land that doesn't belong to them. And they want to convince us that the land of promise is actually called Palestine. Listen, I can assure you that the Lord gave this land to the children of Israel long before the name Palestine was invented by those who now engage in historic revision. Find me a Palestinian language. There isn't such a thing. Find me an ancient Palestinian coin. You won't find it. Find me one ancient Palestinian artifact. It's not there. But we can find ancient Israeli coins, an ancient Hebraic language. We know that the people have dwelt in this land for thousands and thousands of years until the Romans pushed them out according to the prophecy of the Lord Jesus. 
But before that, if we go back and look at the promise made to Abraham, this land was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who was renamed Israel. This was a, a covenant that God made with Abraham many, 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 many years ago, long before Palestine was ever, you know, dreamt up, you know, by, uh, by those who want to conquer this land. It's in Genesis chapter 17 where the Lord assured Abraham of this everlasting covenant. He did this by de declaring this. He says, I will establish my covenant between me and you, speaking to Abraham, and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant. Now, the Hebrew word translated everlasting, it literally means everlasting. It means just everlasting. I don't know, you can't really break it down further than that, right? This is an everlasting covenant. And, and, and God says this to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession and I will be their God. This promise which, which was given to Abraham was then passed on to Abraham's son Isaac and then passed on to Isaac's son Jacob, who was renamed Israel. And this is an everlasting covenant. It's an everlasting promise, which is to say that this land is a possession that belongs to the descendants of Israel forever. And while it's true that the Lord promised to punish them with captivity if they failed to follow his statutes, it's also true that he promised to bring them back into the land according to his perfect timing and perfect will. For example, it's actually in Amos chapter 9 where the prophet Amos writes this. He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed, the mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. This is the promise that God made to Israel through the prophet Amos, that when he brings them back into the land, they'll never again be pulled up. And we've seen this happening. The Lord has reestablished the children of Israel by, by bringing them back into their land. And not only that, but he's now also empowering them to continue defeating their enemies just like he did during the days of David. With that being the case, I want to consider how the conquest of King David brought him to a point of praise. And so with that, I want to take another look here at the 18th Psalm. Look with me at verse 46. Here David declares, the Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God who avenges me and subdues the peoples under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. Great deliverance he gives to his king and shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forevermore. Here in the final verses of this psalm, we find King David, he's once again singing the praises of the one who saved him from the Syrians and from the Amalekites and from the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Philistines. And, and, and he's singing the praises of the God who saved him from the enemies on every side. The Lord is the one who avenged him. And the Lord is the one who delivered David by subduing his enemies under his feet. And it's for this reason that David here gives him the glory, that uh, David here is giving him the thanks. And yes, even in the presence of the Gentiles, King David rejoiced as he considered the mercy of our Messiah, the one who empowered him to establish the nation of Israel there in the midst of their enemies. And I truly believe that we're watching all this happening all over again as the Lord reestablishes Israel there in the land of promise in preparation for the time of Jacob's trouble. With that being the case, Christians ought to be praying for the Lord to reveal his almighty power in all of these conflicts. And, and listen, I, I'm horrified by many of the images that, that, that I see online. I, I, I'm truly just horrified by, by the civilian casualties and, and 
how this is just destroying families on both sides of this conflict, it, it's hard to see it. And so we ought to be praying for the peace of Israel. We ought to be praying for you know, peace in the Middle East. We should be praying that the enemies of Israel might humble themselves under the mighty hand of God so that they might realize that you cannot fight against the God of Israel and survive it. It just won't happen. We should also be praying for the Israelites so that they might realize that the Lord who lives is the rock of their salvation. And would it be to God that they might realize that the Lord who has established them there in the land of promise is the one and only God, the only Savior whose name should be exalted above every name. And let's pray that they might realize that Jesus Christ is the name of their Messiah. That Jesus, Yeshua, is the Messiah. He is the anointed one, the Christ. And let's pray that God would pour out his grace upon those who will embrace the Messiah, Jesus Christ, during these troubling days. As we all know, the state of Israel has been at war with Hamas since last October. Not only that, but the conflict has also invited attacks from Hezbollah from the north the Houthis from the south, and not only them, but it was last April when Iran stepped out from behind their proxies and attacked Israel with more than 200 drones and missiles. And God has continued to grant them the victory over these attacks. At this point in time, we're waiting for yet another attack from Iran. We don't know if it's going to happen or not. I'm guessing at some point it will. And they will once again see how God is reestablishing Israel there in the land of promise. In the midst of all this conflict, we're watching more and more Israelis beginning to seek help from on high. We're beginning to see many Israelis crying out for the Messiah. And it was just last week on the annual day of remembrance when two silver Levitical trumpets were taken to Temple Mount and they were blown there on Temple Mount for the first time in 2,000 years. How incredible is that? Not only that, but there are also red heifers that were shipped from Texas. They're right now in Israel, and and they've been approved by a priest to be used uh, uh, for the cleansing ritual that must take place before the tribulation temple can be built. Can you see what time it is? It's incredible to consider. In light of these things, let's pray for the people there in Israel that they might see the hand of the Lord as he continues to reestablish them there in the land of promise, knowing that what comes next, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. In other words, it's not going to get better soon. If we're watching the world being prepared for the time of tribulation, then these conflicts are going to grow worse and worse. And it's sad to say that many Israelis are going to embrace the Antichrist before they look to Jesus Christ. So let's be praying for all of these people. Let's pray for people on both sides of this conflict that they might all realize that Jesus is our Savior. He is the only rock. He is a fortress for those who trust in him and the the, the deliverer and the redeemer of those who will humbly place their faith in him.